This video will cover the third unit in US politics, looking at the US presidency. This video will cover the following topics of the executive branch. We will look at sources of presidential power, the powers of the president, the vice president, cabinet and exarch, federal bureaucracy, how much power does the president have, theories of the presidency, foreign policy, waxing and waning of presidential power and a comparison with the UK executive branch. This particular video will focus on the structure of the executive branch and the formal powers of the president. The Founding Fathers created a president who would be both head of state and head of the government. This is important to remember. The US president is not just another politician. They are the personification of the nation. Another thing that is important to remember is that the Founding Fathers created a singular executive. The executive power shall be vested in a president of the United States of America are the opening lines in Article 2 of the Constitution. To help the President with his job, there is the Vice President, Cabinet and the Executive Office of the President, all of which will be covered in this video. The final thing to remember about the President is that they are indirectly elected. The President is chosen by the electors in the Electoral College. The Founding Fathers also created a limited and checked President. The Founding Fathers feared tyranny, especially from the Executive Branch. An important fact to remember throughout this video is that presidential power is tidal and it can vary heavily within and between presidents. Let's look at where presidential power comes from. Sources of presidential power stem from the Constitution. This is a formal power detailed in Article 2. For example, Article 2 states that the president is the commander in chief of the armed forces. President George W. Bush used this power to lead the USA in the Afghan and Iraq wars. Then there is also the inherent powers of the executive, the so-called powers as head of the executive, which are also a formal power. These powers are not explicitly mentioned in the Constitution, but are essential to carrying out the role of chief executive. For example, George W. Bush used the power of the chief executive to indefinitely detain terror suspects and then transport them to other countries for interrogation and torture following the 9-11 attacks. Another source of presidential power is Congress, which is an informal power. Powers are delegated to the president by Congress. For example, Congress has delegated the power to impose trade tariffs if that country is involved in unfair trade practices. President Trump introduced a 25% tariff on steel imports. A final source of presidential power is the implicit authority, which can be from Congress or the Constitution. This is a formal power. Action by the President that is not specific to the powers given to him to by Congress or by the Constitution is an example of implicit authority. This is mainly used in the form of emergency powers. For example, President FDR used emergency powers to force Japanese Americans into internment camps during the Second World War. The Constitution confers specific powers on the President. He is the Commander-in-Chief of the Armed Forces, but he cannot declare war. He negotiates and signs treaties with other countries, although they need to be ratified by the Senate. He is in charge of the diplomatic relations with other countries, and he has the power to issue pardons to anyone convicted of a crime. These duties are carried out in the most countries by the head of state, so the President carries this title, although this is not specified in the Constitution. The Constitution also confers the following two powers on the President. They are responsible for appointing people to the head of government departments, subject to confirmation by the Senate, and they can also call Congress back into session during a break, at times of national emergency. These duties are carried out in most countries by the head of the government, so the President carries this title, although again, this is not specified in the Constitution. The powers of the President are his tasks, functions or duties. They are laid out in Article 2 of the Constitution, and they have been the same for every president from George Washington to Joe Biden. These formal powers are often referred to as constitutional powers. Inherent powers are powers belonging to the national government because it is the government of a sovereign state within the world community. Let's break down the formal powers of the president. They can propose legislation. The president has the power to propose legislation to Congress, which they may do in the annual State of the Union address. But the president can propose legislation at any time by, for example, calling a press conference or making an announcement at a public event. They can submit the annual budget. 
The budget is just another piece of legislation, but it's potentially the most important. The Office of Management and Budget draws up the annual federal, federal budget for the President. The OMB is part of the President's own bureaucracy, which is known as the Executive Office of the President. The President then submits the budget to Congress. This is then followed by a lengthy bargaining process between the President and Congress. The President can also sign legislation. Once bills have been passed through a lengthy and complicated legislative process in Congress, they land on the President's desk. The President has a number of options, but the most likely is that of signing the bill into law. This is done for bills that the President wants to take credit for. A President can also veto legislation. As well as signing bills into law, the President has the option of vetoing them. The regular veto is a much used presidential weapon. Even the threat of it can be an important bargaining tool. Congress can override the veto, but this is rarely successful. The President also has the pocket veto at their disposal. The details of this are covered more in the Congress video. The President also acts as Chief of Executive. The President is the Chief Executive, which means he is in charge of running the Executive Branch of the Federal Government. A huge part of this is the day-to-day -day running of the country, which is delegated to those who run the Federal Government's principal departments and agencies, which will be looked at in more detail later on in the video. A President also can nominate Executive Branch officials. An incoming President, such as Donald Trump in 2017, has a host of such posts to fill. The most important of these are the heads of the 15 executive departments, such as the Treasury, State and Agriculture. The Senate must confirm all these apartments, appointments with a simple majority. The President also has the power to nominate all federal judges. The President must fill vacancies not only on the Federal Supreme Court, but also on the Federal Trial and Appeal Courts. All judicial appointments are for life and therefore assume a special importance. They must be confirmed by a simple majority vote in the Senate. Another power of the President is to act as Commander-in-Chief. This power was particularly important for Presidents in office during the 1940s and 1970s. Whether it was FDR fighting in the Second World War, or Harry Truman in Berlin and Korea, Kennedy in Cuba, or Lyndon Johnson and Richard Nixon in Vietnam, Presidents were seen as playing a highly significant role as Commander-in-Chief. After the Cold War and the demise of the Soviet Union, the President's Commander-in-Chief role has diminished. The events of 9-11 changed all this, and George W. Bush found himself thrust into the role of a wartime president. Obama, too, found himself drawn into foreign policy crises in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya and Syria, as well as managing highly sensitive relationships with Israel, Russia and Cuba. As Congress doesn't have many checks on the president in regards to foreign policy, this is where the president can exercise the most power. The president also has the power to negotiate treaties. Most modern day presidents have used this power to negotiate such treaties as the Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty, this was under Reagan, the Chemical Weapons Ban, this was under George H.W. Bush, and a Nuclear Arms Treaty with Russia, this was under Obama. The power is checked by the president as all treaties must be ratified by the Senate with a two thirds majority. During the 20th century, the Senate rejected seven treaties. The first and last were significant in that they were major treaties. In 1920, Woodrow Wilson negotiated the Treaty of Versailles, which the Senate refused to ratify, and then in 1999, President Clinton failed to gain even a simple majority for the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. The President also possesses the power of the pardon, and can use it with varying degrees of frequency. In 1974, President Ford pardoned his predecessor, Richard Nixon, over the Watergate scandal. President Clinton also caused a storm on his final day in office in 2001 when he pardoned 140 people, including the fugitive Mark Rich. Not only do presidents perform all these formal constitutional functions, but they must perform the role of head of state. This is most clearly seen at times of national tragedy when the president takes on the role of commander-in-chief commander and comforter-in-chief, sometimes nicknamed as mourner-in-chief as well. President George W. Bush played this role in the weeks following the 9-11 tragedy. More recently, we saw President Obama play this role following the devastation caused by Hurricane Sandy in 2012, as well as in the aftermath of the Sandy Hook shootings in December of the same year.